Welcome to the latest edition of the Teamsters podcast. I'm Kara Dennis of the Teamsters Communications Department. In this episode, we will take a look at James R. Hoffa Memorial Scholarship Fund, which helps cover post-secondary school costs for children of Teamster members each year. We will also hear about the union's current legislative efforts and what it has planned to help push a pro-worker agenda in the early days of the incoming Biden administration. But to kick things off, I turn to my colleague, David White, who will fill us in on what the JRH scholarship is and how students can apply to help further their educations. David? Thank you, Kara. Right now, there is a great opportunity for Teamster families. If they have children who are in their senior year of high school and they are planning to attend a college or university, now is the time to fill out an application for an academic scholarship from the James R. Hoffa Memorial Scholarship Fund. The fund at www.jrhmsf.org has an online application form. It requires the student to register and fill in information about who they are, who their Teamster parent is, and information about their high school courses. The fund began distributing awards in 2001, and each year since then, they have awarded thousands of dollars of scholarships. What's so great about these scholarships is that all Teamster families are eligible. Whether you are part of the Teamsters or a member of one of our affiliated unions, the Graphic Communications Conference, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, or the Brotherhood of Maintenance Away Employees. The awards range from one-time $1,000 awards to $10,000 awards, which are paid out over a four-year period. I was able to speak to a couple of past winners recently. One was Eric Johnson, who won an award in 2001. Fortunately, we were able to speak with one of the past winners. His name is Eric Johnson. He's speaking to us from Florida, where he currently works. Eric. Could you tell me about your experience with the scholarship? I understand you won in the year 2001. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Thanks, David. It's great to, uh, great to talk to you again. And yeah, I was one of the first uh, scholarship recipients back in 2001, which was 20 years ago, believe it or not, when I was a high school uh, senior applying to college. And it was something that I think my dad, who you know is a Teamster, works for UPS as a truck driver, uh, brought home or, or had heard about it from work and, uh, and let me know about the opportunity. And uh, I took a chance. I applied and was able to uh, be selected, which was a great honor for me. And how did the award of the scholarship financially uh, help out you and your family? Yeah, it was a huge help. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest of uh, three. And so for me, kind of the first one going through uh, the college process, I felt a lot of obligation and responsibility to not, you know, um, take on too much student debt or, or to make it difficult, you know, for my parents to afford it either for me or for uh, my two siblings, my brother and sister. And so, you know, having, you know, looking at those price tags at college and, and the tuition and everything was really overwhelming. You know, I was one of the first people in my college, uh, my family, to, uh, to go to college and graduate from college. And so it was a bit of a new process for me. Uh, and so, you know, getting that, that news uh, from the James Hoffa Scholarship Fund was, was a huge sense of relief, uh, not only for myself to make college that much more affordable and available, but to my, to my whole family, to my brother and sister who were also able to, uh, to then go off and graduate from college. And so all three of us uh, have since gone to college, have become educators, you know, all three of us are teachers. And I feel like, you know, I definitely attribute, you know, the James Hoffa Scholarship Fund is a huge uh, part in our college journey. And what did you, and what did you major in in college, Eric? And where do you find yourself today? Yeah, I, uh, ever since I was in high school, I wanted to be a high school teacher because I had some really uh, transformative high school teachers who really, who cared about me. Uh, as a person, but also, you know, got me really interested in English and history. And so I majored, I went off to college and majored in history uh, and then became a high school history teacher. 
And so uh, I've been in education now for 15 years. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, back uh, about seven years ago, moved down to uh, South Florida, where I'm now a high school principal uh, at a school down here. And so uh, I feel so honored and privileged to be able to uh, to give back to, you know, the educational profession that, again, inspired me on my journey. So you not only got a, I assume, a bachelor's degree, but you went on for a degree higher than that. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. No, I was, uh, you know, because of uh, the scholarship fund, I was able to graduate college with very little student debt, which gave me the financial ability to go on and complete my master's degree in education. Uh, and my doctorate degree. And so back in uh, 2013, I graduated with my doctorate of education from Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And so, uh, and again, the, that whole journey really from um, college, from undergraduate to uh, my doctoral degree, again, all really um, started off with the James Hoffa Scholarship Fund. Well, that's terrific. We have a lot of students that apply each year and we've just opened up the application process. What words of encouragement would you say to high school seniors who are considering applying for the James R. Hoffa scholarship? You absolutely should apply. I mean, every, uh, you know, I know college can be uh, expensive and overwhelming. Again, that was my experience and that was 20 years ago. Uh, but you've got a, an organization, you've got a group of people who want to invest in your future. And I'm still so honored and privileged to think about 20 years ago that a group of people, you know, most of whom I've never met, uh, we're willing and inspired to donate uh, to this scholarship fund and to change the lives of uh, hundreds, if not thousands of, of uh, people now that the scholarship fund has been around for uh, 20 years. And I, you know, I just happened to look at the website and I see that you've got recipients from all over uh, North America, you know, both the United States uh, and Canada. And that's just amazing to, uh, to think of all the lives that have been impacted. And so you absolutely should apply you know, uh, you know, go online, go on the website, fill out the application, uh, take a chance, figure out uh, what you need to submit and uh, realize that it's not just you on this journey, but there's so many people around you, many of whom you'll never meet, who want you to be successful, want you to graduate from college and have uh, a wonderful, meaningful, productive life. And so you absolutely should apply. Well, thank you for those words of encouragement, Eric. We appreciate having you on today, and uh, we will be talking with another uh, scholarship winner uh, later, And uh, but I thank you today for your time. Oh, thank you. No, it's been a privilege. I appreciate so much all the great work you guys are doing, uh, making you know college available and affordable to uh, young people today, so thank you so much. A big part of why the scholarship program is a success is the support the fund has from local unions. Donnie West, president of Local 612 in Birmingham, Alabama, had this to say. Our local union here in Birmingham, Alabama has been a constant supporter of the James R. Hoffa Memorial Scholarship Fund for many years. Each year when the notices come out about the fund being open to applicants, we make sure that our members know about it. Unfortunately, over the years, some of our high school seniors have applied and have won awards. We're very grateful for that. Also, I know you'll be, you'll be talking to Tim Thornton, whose father, Daryl Thornton, was one of our UPS members here at Local 612. Unfortunately, he passed away back in 2002. We were so glad when Tim won the scholarship because we knew that the funds would help him in his college years, and it made it even better when he decided to attend the University of Alabama. The scholarship fund really does make a difference for many Teamster families. As president and business manager of Local 612, I'm very proud to play a small part in such a wonderful program that our great international union provides for our members' children. The next previous winner we're going to speak with is Tim Thornton. Tim Thornton is from Alabama and won a scholarship a few years ago. Tim, can you tell us how winning the scholarship helped you and your family? My parents and grandmother invested heavily in educational opportunities for my sister and me throughout much of my life. We were sent to private school from kindergarten through elementary school to give us the competitive advantage that my family knew was needed to thrive in society. 
My father, Daryl Thornton, was the proudest father you could ever find of his children for the people we were becoming and for what we were capable of accomplishing. Unfortunately, though, just a week prior to me starting my senior year in high school, my father passed away from a sudden heart attack. I remember every detail of that day truly like it was just yesterday. My mother, Susie, was left widowed to care for us. My grandmother, our Lily King, who has been deceased since 2009, stepped in immediately to fill as much of the void as she could. The James Hoffman Memorial Scholarship Fund certainly helped to fill a large portion of the financial void that my father's passing created and helped me to maintain the vision that higher education was still economically attainable. It is truly a blessing to be awarded a scholarship among all the applicants. And Tim, uh, what did you end up studying in college? I studied management information systems. Uh, that was my undergraduate degree. And then I got my master's of business administration degree with a concentration in logistics and supply chain management. And you're currently still in Alabama working, I guess, for the federal government. Is that right? Yes, sir. That is absolutely correct. And I work at procurement now. Oh, that's excellent. Tim, what would you say to other high school seniors who are considering applying for the James R. Hoffa scholarship? They should absolutely apply for the James R. Hoffa Memorial Scholarship. I personally can attribute much of my success to the scholarship fund. It's a great opportunity for us to uh, compete for the opportunity and they will uh, find that if they are, are awarded that they will uh, alleviate uh, much of the financial burden that a lot of young people find uh, when they um, graduate from college and they're going into adulthood and they've got um, in some cases significant student loans and so they certainly want to uh, put their name in the hat, so to speak, to uh, compete for the scholarship because they will certainly find great benefit if they are awarded. The fund also has awards for those planning to go to community college or a trade school for a vocational or training program. These awards were introduced in 2017, and each year we have more and more applicants. All of the vocational programs must relate to a Teamster industry but that's not difficult, seeing as how the Teamsters represent workers in so many industries across the country. I'll conclude with a word of encouragement to all those high school seniors. This is a terrific program, and we now have an efficient way for you to apply. So take a look at the fund's website at www.jrhmsf.org. We may be in the midst of the holidays, but there's still much to be done in the nation's capital. Sunshine McBride, Deputy Director of the Teamsters Department of Political and Legislative Action, fills us in on the latest when it comes to the economic stimulus, the COVID-19 vaccine, and what the Teamsters would like to see happen in the first days of the incoming Biden administration. The last time that I joined the podcast back in September, I spoke about the need to pass a government spending bill by September 30th. That bill, passed in September has now reached its expiration date. And we're again talking about the need to avert a government shutdown by passing a government spending bill by December 18th. Congress had two objectives for the lame duck legislative session, fund the government and pass a stimulus bill. So far, they have been unable to do either. For weeks now, we've seen no progress on a stimulus bill. Then, two weeks ago, a bipartisan framework emerged and was quickly endorsed by both Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer as a viable base on which to build a potentially passable bill. That bipartisan framework totaled $908 billion, far less than the nearly $3 trillion HEROES Act. 
Very little detail and no actual bill language has been made available on the bipartisan framework, but from what we know, it is considerably less generous and less comprehensive than the HEROES Act. The major point of disagreement at this point is the business liability language that the Senate Republicans are assist insisting on. The bipartisan framework contains a six-month moratorium on lawsuits, but the GOP wants federal tort law changes. Senate Republicans are holding additional state and local funding hostage in exchange for what they want on business liability. It's essential that we get this right because an overly broad liability shield could render enforceable safety standards moot. To that point, we're still expecting that the Biden OSHA will swiftly issue enforceable standards on airborne infectious disease, perhaps even by the end of January. Last week, the Biden COVID task force added a new member. David Michaels, who served as OSHA administrator under President Obama. Adding an expert in workplace safety to the Biden COVID team is something that the Teamsters pushed for specifically in our submission to the Biden Department of Labor transition team. So we're quite pleased to see Michaels as an addition to the task force. If agreement isn't reached on even this moderately sized stimulus package in the lame duck session, it is still possible that the expiring stimulus programs unemployment insurance and paid leave could be extended in the spending bill. And then a comprehensive stimulus package would be the first order of business under the newly inaugurated Biden administration. That being said, in recent days, the coalition working on paid leave has been pessimistic about the paid leave extension happening, happening at all in the lame duck. The House and the Teamsters are still pushing hard for that. Until Congress actually leaves town and turns out the lights for the holiday recess, we will continue to fight for all of the same stimulus priorities that we have been fighting for throughout the pandemic, including pension protection. We have long viewed the lame duck legislative session as possibly presenting a real opportunity to move a solution on multi-employer pensions, and we continue to push that possibility with our congressional champions. Given that this is my first update since the election, I want to also briefly speak about the transition process. We have been in communication with the Biden transition team on both policy and personnel decisions. The first stage of the formal transition process is always the development of what is referred to as agency review teams, which are made up of issue experts and stakeholders. These teams make recommendations on personnel for each agency and for early executive policy action that can be made in the first 100 days of the new administration. We have submitted policy recommendations for both short and long-term needs to these teams on core teams for priorities like pension protection, transportation and automation, trade and implementation of NAFTA 2.0, and labor standards with particular emphasis on worker safety, misclassification, and NLRA reform. We're hopeful for a big victory in Georgia, which would certainly dramatically impact legislative planning and strategy for the 117th Congress. But even without a pro-worker majority in the Senate, there is much that can be accomplished in our union's priority issue areas through executive and administrative action. And we're looking forward to having the most pro-union president and administration in modern history. And we intend to take full advantage of this opportunity to push a bold agenda for Teamster families. Another significant federal action in the past week was emergency approval by both the CDC and the FDA of the first vaccine to fight the coronavirus as well as the release of recommendations by the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices on Vaccine Prioritization. The CDC Advisory Committee issued recommendations on December 1st for who should be in the first wave of vaccination. They are calling this first wave 1A. The CDC Advisory Committee recommended that wave 1A inoculate healthcare workers and residents and staff of long-term care facilities. After that first wave of vaccination, the CDC recommends that the vaccination be prioritized for essential workers tied to the viability of critical infrastructure, as is defined by the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security guidance is quite comprehensive and includes several key Teamster industries that have played a central role in keeping America functioning since March. Transportation and logistics, sanitation, law enforcement and corrections, transit, food processing, school bus, and much more. It is important to note that the CDC's recommendations on priority order for vaccination are non-binding, which means that a considerable amount of discretion will be given to states to determine their own priority tiers for distribution. States submitted preliminary plans for vaccine distribution in October and final plans last Friday. 
but they were forced to submit these plans without knowing if they will be provided with more stimulus funds for vaccine distribution, without a real understanding of how many doses they will receive, and in the midst of a presidential transition. So it is reasonable to expect that these plans will be amended. The states have a significant role to play in vaccine distribution, and that means that Teamster relationships with state and local government will be key in the same way that those relationships have been so important throughout the pandemic in influencing state level health and safety standards. We encourage everyone at the local level to review the plan submitted by your state earlier this month and reach out to your local government contacts to urge labor's inclusion as a full stakeholder in the vaccine distribution process moving forward at the state level. Teamster members have the greatest number of essential worker members doing work that touches nearly every essential industry. As we all saw this week, Right now, Teamster members are safely driving the vaccine to distribution locations. Now more than ever, Teamsters are keeping America moving, and we deserve early access to a safe and effective vaccine. At the federal level, we are working both independently and in coalition with the broader labor community to keep Teamster members and our work in clear focus as we transition from one president and administration to the next. The IBT is in frequent contact with the Biden transition team and administration leadership as they are named, about member health and safety needs and vaccine distribution. We expect to be in frequent contact with Teamster local leadership as more information becomes available about vaccine distribution and the most impactful actions that we can take at the state and federal level are narrowed down. I also hope to return to the podcast in January with a more detailed look at our legislative goals for the 117th Congress, hopefully with a victory in Georgia and a pro-worker majority in the Senate. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Teamsters podcast. The Teamsters want everyone to enjoy a happy and healthy holiday season. Join us next time for another episode from America's Strongest Union. And be sure to check out www.teamster.org regularly for updates.